This book has me questioning my very existence. Hi, welcome to another Sanctified Punk book review. Today we're going to be reading Pagan Christianity? Question mark by Frank Viola and George Barna. Subtitle of this one is Exploring the Pagan Roots of uh, Church Practices. And it's a doozy! This book breaks down all of the elements of modern Christianity and then traces them all the way back to their New Testament origins and then follows them throughout history as they're mixed with different cultural practices. Basically, how did we get here? It's a really interesting read because it kind of asks the question, if you were to look at the church in the New Testament and the church that Jesus established, does it match what we make today? The answer is kind of no. As someone who has grown up and always kind of felt funny about religious-y, church-y things, always liking the Bible but always feeling weird about church, pastors, giving offering, sitting in a lecture for an hour on Sunday, this book was almost a little bit of catharsis for me because it made me feel like I wasn't crazy or heretical for disliking certain things about church, but it was also a little bit difficult in the way that it kind of goes hard against certain things that we think of as essential to part of the church. It's kind of a deconstructive book where you're taking concepts that you've known forever and then deconstructing them and asking why, why over and over again. It can be kind of exciting or kind of discouraging, probably depending on what you've been raised with. I can imagine if you're very married to certain concepts about church or you're really, really loyal to a certain denomination, really any denomination, Catholic, Protestant, I think that you could read this and be very offended. The reason why I know this offends people is because this is not the first edition of this book. This book has been published before and people have read it and written and written and written and written to Frank, Viola, and George Varna and told them, hey, I have a problem with this, I have a problem with this, what about this, what about this? And they include in the updated version their responses to all of their criticism. So he's constantly putting an asterisk after statements and going, hey, I know you may be wondering about this, let me clarify. So I appreciate that he clarifies so much because the second you start asking a question, you'll realize that someone has already asked him that question and he's answered it. So who is this book for? That's a hard question. I would recommend this to people who like to be challenged academically because it is a harder read. It's not a super long book, but it is um, very academic in its vocabulary. It is historical, so if you don't mind a little bit of history textbook, it kind of does that a little bit. I would recommend it to somebody who was a church planter or who uh, was running a church themselves. Um, I think starting from square one and looking at what is the origin of some of these practices will help maybe people reevaluate their priorities and what's really important in church. I would only recommend this to someone who was planning on reading the entire thing. Out of context, this book could be used to divide. So I recommend it to people who only plan on reading the entire book. I would not recommend this to somebody who was a new Christian because I think it would be very confusing. Um, but I would recommend it to somebody who was very critical of the church but found themselves liking Jesus. So if that's you, maybe this will be a good one for you. I would not recommend it to someone who naturally sees paganism wherever they go and likes to finger point at certain things and go, can't do that, that's pagan, can't do that, that's pagan. Just because something is pagan in origin doesn't mean it's a bad thing or an evil thing or something you can't do. Heck, your iPhone was invented by an atheist. Half the foods you eat were from pagan cultures. Pagan doesn't necessarily mean bad, it just means not necessarily Christian. 
it's really important to make sure that you're using a lot of critical thinking because I could see some folks who get very uh, conspiracy theory use this book as ammunition to go crazy at their pastor and tell their pastor that they're evil, go on the internet and talk about how all church is bad. Just because a church does a pagan inspired practice doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means it's not necessarily following the formula that was spelled out in the New Testament. And we would avoid a lot of problems in the modern church if we just followed that pattern a little more naturally. So if you think that you're someone who naturally falls into conspiracy or wanting to maybe call out pastors and accuse them of things, maybe this book is gonna be a stumbling block for you and maybe you wanna avoid it. It's okay, I get it. Conspiracy, conspiracy videos are fun. We, we've all been there. This book was a challenge. It was very different than anything I've ever read before. Um, I think the closest thing I've read to this would be uh, Letters to the Church by Francis Chan, which I really love. And I would say if you liked that book, you might like this one. If you're worried this one would be hard, maybe check that one out instead. But yeah, this one was challenging, but I liked it a whole lot. Um, I like being challenged. I like, um, I like more academic stuff, so I enjoyed this. Um, but it was hard. There's a chapter that focuses just on the pastor, and it's called The Pastor, The Obstacle to Every Member Functioning. So this book talks a lot about how one of the biggest issues in the church is that a New Testament church is every single person participates. It's not a hierarchy. There's no clergy class and laity class. Everyone's on equal playing field and everybody is expected to participate. It's not a spectator sport. I used to be on a church staff and my husband used to be on a church staff and he criticizes both how having a paid staff can be harmful to the people and how it can be harmful to the people in those paid staff positions. When I was reading the section about how it prevents people from functioning, I naturally got very defensive because one of my big struggles as someone on a church staff was recruiting volunteers and how nobody seemed like they had time to volunteer for church. Everybody had suggestions for what they wanted to see, but hardly anyone was willing to um, contribute their time. Like it was a very small percentage of people doing the vast majority of the work. And so honestly, like I had been very judgmental towards people in church who don't volunteer because I had seen it as people being lazy and not caring about their faith. And so it made me wonder, would people really step up if there wasn't a church staff? Maybe. But the second half of the chapter really hit me hard because it talks about how devastating a church staff position is to the person in the position. And holy smokes, was it real. Let me just read some stats that he gives because, and keep in mind, every single thing that he mentions is something that I either personally experienced, my husband experienced, or we had seen our church staff friends experience. So he writes, among this massive number of religious professionals, considering the following statistics that testify to the lethal danger of the pastoral office, he uses really strong terms. Here we go. 94% feel pressured to have an ideal family. 90% work more than 46 hours a week. 80% say they have insufficient time with their spouses. 80% believe that pastoral ministry affects their family negatively. 70% do not have someone they consider a close friend. 70% have lower self-esteem than they did when they entered the job. 50% feel they're unable to meet the demands of the job. 
80% are discouraged or deal with depression. More than 40% report that they're suffering from burnout, frantic schedules, and unrealistic expectations. 33% consider pastoral ministry an outright hazard to the family. 33% have seriously considered leaving their position in the past year. 40% of pastoral resignations are due to burnout. Yeah. Every single one of those applied to me. Every single one of those applied to my husband. Maybe I need to make a video about my past on church staff because it is rough, you guys. And you start to feel very defensive when you read this book and go, of course there needs to be paid staff on a church. Of course. But when you read statistics like this, this book is, is full with, of moments where you go, you, you get defensive, and then you look at his argument and you go, I get it. Like I said, this book is not for everybody. And I really don't want people to read this book and become critical of churches and start hammering their pastors or start calling church blasphemous or that kind of stuff because that's not productive. So I'm gonna take that big asterisk into account when I rate this book. Like it's a 10 for me personally, but because you really have to read context into it, it's gonna lose a couple of points. We're gonna give Pagan Christianity a eight, solid 8.0, a B minus. But it is good and I do like it. It reminded me of my church staff PTSD, which was fabulous. Gotta work through that, not bury it down. So if you'd like to read this book and you promise to read this whole thing, and you promise not to go out there and use this as ammunition to hurt people, and call them pagan, or hurt their feelings, highly recommend. I love you guys. Go out there and act like Jesus. I'll see you next time. Bye.